So recently our Sangha uh, started looking at the ox herding pictures on our Tuesday night um, and uh, as a way to talk about practice. So um, a short talk and then what we're, and then questions. And uh, is there anybody who has never heard of these? Okay, um, there are a series of um, eight or 10 or 12, it, it depends on the version, uh, pictures and poems. And they function as a metaphor for stages um, on the training path of Zen. They tend to be a little bit uh, traditional in terms of the uh, way training is seen. And um, the metaphor is that the ox stands for our true nature, not only our true nature, but the true nature of everything. And, um, and then there's this little man who's searching for the ox. So I'll show you some of these pictures. Um, and I'm really, really gonna talk about the first three because what I found as I started looking at these um, is that the, the latter stages, maybe three through 10, uh, they, uh, four through 10, uh, they tend to, in a way, take care of themselves. It's not that they're, they're, they're not important or that there isn't work to be done, but, but where most of our angst is, most of our struggle seems to be around uh, the first three. And um, that is uh, searching for the ox, uh, finding the traces of the ox or just starting to see and then uh, seeing the ox for the first time, glimpsing the ox for the first time. Um, and of course, even to talk about these stages is to invite comparison and judgment. So I'll just uh, ask you right from the start, try not to get too caught up in that and just use what's useful for you and discard what, what isn't. And um, as I actually, I, I realized when I started looking at these that I had always been a little bit resistant to, to these ox herding pictures. And I think it's because they seem to um, express such a rigid approach to practice, a rigid path to practice with different stages that you go through and you, know, you don't miss a stage and you progress from one you leave that stage behind, then you go to the next one, master that, leave that behind and go to the next one. And that's not my experience. And my guess is it's not your experience either. Um, the truth is we cycle back through these stages. I mean, sometimes within one day we cycle back. And um, although we never completely go back to where we were, uh, it's always different, it's always new. But each of us is always starting back over and over again um, throughout our life of practice, really. And uh, sometimes we really start over again. In other words, we feel that everything's been lost and, and we really have to um, just begin again with a beginner's mind. So I started to see it more kind of like a spiral that, that you were constantly revisiting the different stages but maybe never quite exactly the same. I hope that makes sense. Um, and um, this issue of uh, starting over that uh, you can be um, somebody who's practiced. I've, I realized recently, I have now been practicing for 50 years and I am absolutely still a student and absolutely um, starting over again and um, uh, um, many times over the last few years. And um, at times we can be overrun with doubt and uncertainty. And, and yet we know that um, we start to be more uh, able to tolerate that experience and, and just to uh, redirect and, and rejoin our practice. So I found two sources and I'll just show these to you. One is by Martine Batchelor and she is um, uh, she's a Zen a Buddhist um, nun with a practice in Korea, but uh, she tends to be very psycho, uh, psychologically oriented. It, it reads more like Vipassana. So the version that I've really used the most 
is this one, Riding the Ox Home by John Dido Lorry. And of course, he's very much uh, geared towards practice. And I'll show you these pictures. This is the first picture. Can you see the little guy? And this, this picture is um, Searching for the Ox, which I think is in a way the fundamental picture. Um, it's really the foundation for our practice. And if you take a minute and just remember when that impulse first arose in you, maybe it was when you were really very young, maybe even as a child, um, and you wonder, you know, who am I? What is this life for? It said that Dogen um, first experienced the arousing of his doubt when he, he lost his parents at an early age and when he saw the uh, smoke from the incense at the funeral, I think of his mother just coming up and dissolving in the air. Uh, he all of a sudden, um, the, this great doubt was uh, aroused in him. And of course, it took him on um, quite a journey, even all the way uh, to China, which at that time was really something. Um, and it may be later in our life when even after we've accomplished a good deal and um, should be content perhaps, um, and yet we realize that we're not at peace. Or maybe it's when somebody, someone that we love um, gets sick and we lose them, or maybe we get sick and realize that our life is not endless, that at some point um, we too will die and pass away. So uh, who knows where this, this doubt comes from, this what we call the great doubt, but it is, I think, a really important aspect of um, spiritual path. Without it, it's really hard. Um, in a way, it's kind of hard to keep going. Some people come to our seminars and say they just want inner peace. They just want to be comfortable. And as all of you know, I think, practice actually isn't comfortable. It isn't. I mean, the reward is to be, to learn to be with that discomfort, but our life is not comfortable and our practice often is not comfortable. Um, and yet there's a great joy in that. So um, this issue of um, uh, arousing the question, I think is really important. Dido points out that our questions need to be real and that they also need to be clear. And um, you'll remember this very famous quote from Dogen, the study the way, the, that is to say the path, is to study the self. And the way we undertake that is through our zazen, not just our sitting practice, but not just calming or quieting our minds, but actually investigating who and what we are. And pretty quickly, what, what do we come up against? We come up against our own conditioning, these very strong forces that, um, are our habits of thinking and our habits of being and our habits of behaving and our assumptions about who and what we are. And often this is what we've been identifying with for a long, long time. Uh, and it's what we call me. It's, it's the story of me. And so the, the, the fundamental question is what, you know, what is this? What is this really? So Dido also points out that the first stage lasts as long as we need to let go of the baggage we are carrying on our backs. It depends on what we are bringing into the present. There are no shortcuts. Well, I, uh, I think by his definition, probably the first stage lasts our life um, because it takes a lifetime to um, uh, let go of this baggage that we're carrying. But what does happen is that the burden becomes much less. The baggage becomes more transparent, if you will. And, and uh, he doesn't say that we need to get rid of it. And he doesn't need to say that we need to fix it all, um, just not to be consumed by it so that we are, are able to um, allow our minds to become quiet and still. And over and over again, you know, of course, our, our conditioning is going to arise. And that's where we start rubbing up against, uh, you know, it's the dukkha, it's the, the sense of being off. And we, we rub up against the world and um, against our own tendencies and what happens. And um, this is, um, it's, um, it's where the rubber meets the road, if you will. Um, one of uh, his students said about Philip Kaplow, who was my very first teacher, 
was that he wore his personality like a suit of old clothes. So it's not that he took all the clothes off, he wore them, but he was comfortable in them and he didn't worry about it anymore. The um, verse for this path is vigorously cutting a path through the brambles, you such search for the ox. Wide rivers, eternal mountains, the path seems endless. With strength depleted and mind exhausted, you cannot find it. There is only the gentle rustle of maple leaves and the cicada's evening song. It's quite beautiful. So no one is free of these brambles and we all experience them. And at times they do seem endless, kind of like the briar patch where the moment you get in, you're sort of stuck. Greed, anger, and ignorance, um, they rise endlessly. So another important part of this uh, first stage or this fundamental stage is um, the acknowledgement of discouragement and self-doubt. And for most of us, these are really old friends. We know them well. And the question is just how do we get co-opted by them? And um, uh, we can become tired and exhausted. We rest and then we start again. Um, and that's the important thing uh, to come back. That's really the essence, I think, of practice is remembering coming back, remembering coming back at, along with this underlying question or this doubt or uh, you know this um, uh, inquiry, which doesn't really have a sentence or a, a name to it. And when we come back, we become aware of what's here. You know, it's the rustle of the leaves uh, when the wind blows. It's the moon outside your window, uh, the crunch of snow. And um, uh, what I always hear is the, the breathing of my dog who's very old. So she has, she has a, a particular raspy way of breathing. Um, and I also wanted to say that one of the wonderful things about your training here uh, where you uh, at um, the Great Heart uh, is the Great Heart Way training uh, and uh, to explicitly look at how you relate to your own conditioning can be really, really helpful. And I think it's one of the things that all of us have realized um, as we've practiced for many years that it's important for each of us to, to be able to do that. So the second stage, finding the traces of the ox, and I have that picture. Here's the little fellow. I don't know if you can see him, but of course you can't actually see the traces in this picture, but presumably it's that you, oh, uh, maybe it's the footprints. There they are, little footprints. So after we've been practicing for a little bit, um, and it doesn't even have to be that long, things start to become a little bit clearer, a little bit more settled. Um, and that is in a way uh, starting to see the traces. Um, we start to have some stability in our practice. And of course that means that we start to have a little more stability in our life. Now, um, there is nothing that doesn't constantly express the Dharma. So these traces are everywhere. It's just a question of being able to see them, being awake enough to see them and to recognize them. And so um, uh, even in our difficulties or when things are not going well, um, those times when it's a little bit tough and we have just have to keep going, the traces are actually there. Um, and oh, it's important to, to look and, uh, um, uh, and just to be open to any experience that arises. And then the third picture is that of seeing the ox. And uh, I thought this picture was pretty funny because um, what it's trying to express is that our first glimpse is often kind of a shallow one and uh, we don't always see the ox completely. So here we're just seeing the back end of the ox, but you can still tell that it's an ox, right? But maybe it's a horse or a cow. You know, you can't tell for sure sometimes and that's why it's really helpful to have a teacher. But 
um, this at the same time, we know we have seen something. And um, this is the moment when we become completely awake, our, uh, the self drops away, and uh, we are uh, replaced by the 10,000 things we see into our own nature and the nature of really of everything and we're not separate from anything. Um, that experience, that initial experience can be um, fairly light or it can be really very deep and um, shattering even, but it is a paradigm shift. It's, it's a, a fundamental shift in um, uh, how we live and how we see. And um, even, uh, and of course it's impossible to talk about and here I am starting to get into trouble. Um, so there can be a complete dropping away of everything or it can just be as subtle as um, focusing a lens, just very slight shift and yet everything seems quite different. And sometimes people don't even know if something really has changed. But over time, it becomes clear that something has changed. Something fundamental has, has changed. And I think this is also one of the reasons why we often don't talk about our own experiences because um, we somehow start to imagine, well, I'd like that person's experience and we might miss our own, you know. So there, there tends to be um, a I guess a reluctance to talk too much about our own experiences. And I think there's good reason for that. But it is important to talk about that with the person that you're working with, your teacher. Um, in that moment, it's not that our life circumstances change, but that our troubles and our worries no longer seem as relevant. Um, uh, one of my first teachers, Tony Packer, used to say it was like taking off a pair of tight shoes, you know, um, a sense of just ease in um, wherever you are, no matter what you're doing. And um, because it's our own intimate experience, our doubt falls away in that moment. And it's uh, the a way of thinking about this is that it's just like drinking water. If you had to describe what it's like to drink water, you could never really do it so that another person could taste it the way you do. And yet you know it for yourself, what it's like to drink water. It's instantaneously uh, apparent to you. Um, for those of you who are parents, um, I always thought that a good analogy was um, hearing your baby cry at night. There's nobody else's cry that is exactly like that. You know that cry intimately. And, um, and yet you could never say what's different about it or why you recognize it. So it's like that, the sense of recognizing something that is so close to you um, and has always been there, of course. So Dokken wrote that to study the way is to study the self and to study the self is to forget the self. And it is in, when the self is forgotten, when we let ourselves go, um, that uh, the world drops away and that um, we become whatever is, is here, uh, whether it's a tree rustling in the wind, whether it's um, you know, the sound of a bell over Zoom or the rustling of my paper, that's, that's just who and what we are. Um, the poem for this stage goes, the song of the yellow oriole echoes in the forest, warm sun, gentle breeze, willows green along the shore. The ox has no place to turn in the brambles. That means it's obvious, it's right in front of you. The song of the bird replaces us, that's our whole body. The sun, the breeze, the gentle green, that's just who we are. And so our personal identification that's me, that, even that sentence, that's just a fantasy, it's an idea. Um, this is an experience. And there's a difference also between being lost in a beautiful sunset or a movie or even a dream and being awake. When you've been sleeping at night and you wake up, you know that there's a difference. You know that dreaming was dreaming and that you are awake now. Now you are awake. 
And I, I think that is um, uh, what it's like. Dido says, the truth is no longer a, an idea, it's our body and mind. And that is true. It is just who we are. Something very hard to describe or even talk about. So I'm already in big trouble. And yet, you know, Philip Kaplow, Kaplow Roshi used to say that if you don't talk about it, nobody thinks it's real. And the, it is real and it is available, a real experience available to each of us. And so what I wanted to do was read a section of a book by Morinaga, Morinaga Roshi. Um, he's a modern Japanese uh, teacher who died a number of years ago. And I've always just really loved this section and I, I read it to you for your encouragement. All people, regardless of how their lives are structured, hold themselves dear. Everyone wants to be happy. And enlightenment is the starting point of happiness. We can use the words true self-confidence in place of enlightenment. Confidence in the true self is a necessary prerequisite to happiness. The power in which you can come to believe in yourself is not gained through training, no matter how much we train. It is the great power that transcends the self, that gives life to the self. The purpose of Zen practice is to awaken to the original power of which you have lost sight, not to gain some sort of new power. When you have sought and sought and finally exhausted all seeking, that's very important. You have to exhaust your doubt, exhaust it. You become aware of that with which you have been from the beginning before ever beginning to search abundantly blessed. After you, after you have ceaselessly knocked and knocked, you realize that the door was standing wide open even before you ever started pounding away. That is what practice is all about. Not only in places especially set up for training, but anytime, anywhere, the person who exerts himself or herself with dignity without worrying about results, without giving in to disappointment, is a true practitioner, a true person of the way. I believe that just this is the form of true human well-being. So I had a few final points, but I wonder instead whether we should do questions. Well, I'll say these really quickly. The first one is, is that okay? <laughs> the first one is, if you don't knock on the door, if you don't practice and arouse your own questioning spirit, there is nothing to resolve. And you can't at some point realize that the door was already open. So we got to knock. And time is irrelevant. The period of time, we, we obsess about the period of time that it takes for us. But practice is a matter of our entire life beyond this life. Time is totally irrelevant. It's a matter of personal karma. So it really helps if you can just stop worrying about that. I know that's not hard to say, and it is hard to do sometimes, but truly that is important. Because if you're spending all of your time worrying, then you're actually not looking. Each of us already has what we need, but we have to see it for ourselves. We have to realize it for ourselves. And it's not what we expect because what we expect is an idea. So our expectations are really not important. And that's, uh, as I said, why we tend not to talk too much about our own personal experiences. Lastly, I think it's much better to think of realization or enlightenment as a verb, as a, as a practice, as a functioning, rather than a possession or an experience that you have and then you hold. And um, uh, anyway, that it's, it's uh, think of it as a verb and it will be very helpful to you, I think. And that's, I'll take questions and, um, or discussion, anybody can answer. <laughs>